you've been looking up here on the screen for a while, I've had that up there. I decided I'm going to give you the jello pudding and whipped cream first. Then I want to give you some pulled pork after. It's okay to eat dessert first. That's me. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. I want you to notice this because what I, one of the things I learned is God's word is in order and there are patterns all in this book. And different numbers mean different things, and I don't have time to get into all that. But how many, how many books are there in our Bible? 66 books. Now, the Catholic Bible has something like 74 books in it. They add the Apocrypha, which I've read part of it. It's a joke. They've even added verses uh, and chapters to the book of Daniel. Ridiculous things that they've done. And uh, it's crazy, but everything is right and perfect in this Bible. And I, I, I read Isaiah 34, 4, all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved and the heaven shall be rolled together as a scroll. And I, and I want you to notice something. What does this look like here? This, these are, this is a galaxy, by the way. It's a cluster of stars. What does it look like? A rolled up scroll. Okay. God said he would roll the heavens up like a scroll and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth from the vine and as a falling fig from the fig tree. Well, that verse is repeated in the book of Revelation, chapter 6, verse 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And if you add the all the words from Isaiah 34, 4 and all the words from Revelation 6, 14, the total number of words is 66 exactly. And both of those, see what there is, there's two witnesses. Out of the mouth of two witnesses, let every word be established. So I'm going to show you some neat things with the number 66 tonight. By the way, I just love looking at galaxies, stars. Who made, who made the stars? God did. God rolled them up. Every galaxy is rolled up in a, in a very particular pattern. I could, I could look at these pictures all night. These are all different, and yet they're all the same in that they're rolled up exactly the same way. See this one? There's actually two of them here. Rolled up like a scroll in a spiral. And I'm going to show you that spiral in a minute. There's, there's another one there. Now, this is one of my favorite pictures in the whole world. You've heard of the Hubble telescope, correct? Okay. What I, here's, I want everybody to do this. I want you to take your fingers and I want you to put them together about like this and just put like the smallest distance between your two fingers and just kind of hold it up to the, to the roof there. Everybody, no, it doesn't mean anything, but I love to see everybody do that. It's funny. <laughs> No, it really does. I have a purpose for that. They took the Hubble telescope and they aimed it at a spot in heaven about like that. For about two weeks. And they picked up. You see all those lights there? Those are not stars. They're galaxies. Every dot of light that you see on that picture is a cluster of at least a hundred billion or more stars each. And God created every one of them. And we didn't even know those existed until we sent Hubble up there and they aimed it up there. In fact, there, there it is. Here's the size that they were looking at, they thought that was empty space, that there was nothing there. And when they aimed the Hubble at it for about two or three weeks, they got that image out of there. And every dot on that picture is a cluster of stars, at least a hundred billion a piece. And there's more that we can't even see beyond that. The heavens big, amen. Who's calling my phone? It says spam risk. Should I answer it? I don't, I don't believe so. Notice, notice that. Notice the spirals on every one of them. And 
you know what I believe? That's just how I am. I believe the Bible. I believe every one of those stars represents an angel. Are not stars angels? Is that not what the Bible says? Okay, so I want you to think about that for a minute. Now let's look at this. I want, I like numbers. I'm not a mathematician. I'm not a genius. I hated math in school. But I want you to notice this pattern here. Zero plus one equals... One plus one equals... Two plus one is... Three plus two... Five plus three... And then... It, that's called the Fibonacci sequence of uh, Italian mathematician about 300 years ago figured that out. You take any sequence of numbers like one and one and you add the previous number to that number and it comes up with the next number then add the number behind it to come up with the next number in the sequence and so on. When you after you get up to like 55 and 89 and see 34 and 55 equal 89 144, is that number significant in the Bible? Yes, it is. Okay. Did you know the word Jerusalem is in the New Testament of your King James Bible exactly 144 times? It's perfect. 12 times 12. That's gross. Never mind. You didn't get that joke. It's called the golden ratio. It's called God's ratio. And it ends up mathematically being to 1 to 1.618. Now, let me show you something. If you keep going, like 233, 377 plus 233 is 610. 610 plus 377 is 987 and so on. If you keep going and you divide those numbers with each other, you end up with 1.618 every single time. So it's called the golden ratio. Now, take a look at this boy's head. Notice the swirl. Who has a little boy about this age? You, okay. Does your little boy have that swirl in the back of his head? You got two of them. Okay. Everybody does. I'm showing you a signature. I'm showing you that the, the creator left his signature on everything that he created. And it's this, and it's this pattern here. Okay? So it's, he's got the Fibonacci sequence. You see it, let me, let me show it to you like this. These two boxes here are like one inch. One plus one equals two. Two plus one equals three. Three plus two equals five. So this box is five inches. And three plus five equals eight. Eight plus five is thirteen. And so on. Okay, everybody follow me so far? Now let me show you where you see that. Okay, I, there it is. One, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen. Okay, now somebody do something for me real quick. Add those numbers up. Thirty-three. Who in the Bible was thirty-three years old? his signature and he'll always be 33 years old amen he'll never be 35 36 37 he's always going to be 33 years old okay this is his signature on everything my daughter did that for me i didn't i didn't count it i was showing it to my daughter one time she said 33 i went what she said add them up 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 5 plus 8 plus 13 is 33. And I went, oh, you're a genius. Now, look at that. Look at that galaxy now. See the spiral of that galaxy? Who made that galaxy? The man who's 33. He left his signature on it, didn't he? See that shell? Who made that shell? The man who's 33, because he left his signature on it. 
See that? See that spiral? Same ratio. Same pattern. I don't care if you like broccoli or not. Same pattern. Who made that? The man who's 33. See that? Grass. Grass is in a spiral. Rose petals, the spiral. Look at that. The man who's 33 made that. The tail of a chameleon, same spiral. Elephant's trunk, fern leaves, chameleon's tail, pine cones, exact same ratio spiral in everything. Boy's hair, flowers, chameleon's tail, the seahorse. See the Fibonacci spiral? Not just in the tail, but in his belly area. Same pattern, same spiral. Do this with your hand. When you do that with your hand and measure it out, it's the same pattern. Fibonacci spiral. Waves. Now, who makes waves? God does. God makes waves, doesn't he? Waves are made by wind blowing in water to the coast. The more water and the more wind you have, the bigger the waves are going to be. But they always break in the exact same pattern. When you flush your toilet... The water doesn't just go straight down, does it? Exact same. Some of you kids are going to go home and go, wow, Jesus did that. <laughs> the keys on a piano. This is an octave from C to C. How many black keys are there? That's a Fibonacci number. How many white keys are there? Eight. That's a Fibonacci number. Uh, notice that they're in, they're in groups. How many are here? How many are here? One, one, two, three, five, eight. An octave. Let me play an octave for you. I'm getting off camera, which I never do. When I go from middle C to high C or low C to middle C, I've played an octave and I've just played the number 33. Say that word backwards. Wow. Sounds the same, doesn't it? Do you know what this is? Cinnamon roll. Cinnamon roll. I can tell where your mind is. This is the cochlea of your ear. This is how you hear things. Same spiral, isn't it? Who made it? Who made that that way? Let him that hath ears, let him hear. And we hear in a Fibonacci spiral with the number 33. What is that? Whirlwind, hurricane, whirlwind, same spiral, exact same spiral. In fact, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice, see the stars and they're all angels and they're in that 33 cluster and you hear them with the cochlea in your ear wrapped up in that cluster of Fibonacci sequence, the number 33, it's all there. It's the sum of perfection. Notice this. Notice that ram's horn. Look at that. Now, how many horns does a ram have? So if one of them represents 33, what does the other one represent? Number of books in the Bible. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, what is the trumpet now? It's the word of God, isn't it? 
When John was in the Lord's day, when he was in the spirit, he heard a voice behind him as the sound of a... And he turned around, it was Jesus Christ. When we're to sound the trumpet, we're to sound the word of God. Somebody say amen. amen. Uh, you, your pastor told you, told you that the last few nights have been talking about soul winning, soul winning, soul winning. Can you win souls? Can you save anybody without the word of God? No, then you better start reading this thing. Because the internet's outdoing us all. Uh, you, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout in the wall. Watch this. Watch this. Did you, do you, you see the rapture here? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a... And with the sound of a trumpet. And here, this is Joshua 6, when the walls of Jericho fall down, this, they sounded the trumpet... And the walls fell down and they shouted with a great shout. It's a picture of the last days and the rapture. And all the people went up, the Bible says. You read, you read Joshua 6, it's in there. And how many times did they march around Jericho? No. You, they get it wrong every time. How many times? Not seven times. Thirteen. One, one, two, three, five, eight. Thirteen. One time a day for six days, seven times on the seventh day. Isn't that something? Aren't you, aren't you glad I came? I am. Revelation 1.10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. He heard the trumpet, Fibonacci ram's horn. He heard it with the Fibonacci cochlea in his ear. Whew. Twice, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Job 40 verse 6, so then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind. Twice, that's in the book of Job. So if you have one whirlwind, that's 33. If you have two whirlwinds, that's... Read the whole Bible. Amen. Well, I got my pocket New Testament. No, 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 no. Read the whole Bible. Look at your ear. Your ear is designed in the same ratio. Same curl. Same pattern. The pattern in my hand has the same ratio. This part of my finger added to this part of my finger is, is the same length as this part of my finger. And this part of my finger and this part of my finger is the same length as this part of my hand. My whole hand is in, in that same ratio. Everything about your body is in that same Fibonacci pattern. Everything is. If any man have ears to hear, let him... So how many years do you have? 66. Mm -mm -mm. Second Peter chapter one, verse 17, for he received from God, the father, honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And this voice, which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Who's the day star? Jesus Christ. Numbers 24, 17. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a what? Star. Capital S. Who is that? It's Jesus Christ. Star out of Jacob. And a scepter shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and shall destroy all the children of Seth. So the Bible's telling you in two places that the beloved son of God, Jesus Christ, is a star. He is the son of righteousness. Amen? Now watch this. 
66th book of the Bible, Revelation 22, 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. The word stars fit, mentioned 15 times in the King James Bible. The word stars is mentioned 51 times in the King James Bible. The total is 66 times in the King James Bible. Don't just amen, go woo! The total number of the word star or stars is 66 times in your Bible. Woo! They that be wise shall be as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as what? The stars forever and ever. So that's all about soul winning, isn't it? He that winneth souls is wise. Somebody say amen. amen. Watch this. When the morning stars sang together, stars are angels, aren't they? And all the sons of God shouted for joy. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise ye him, all ye stars of light. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. Watch this now. Watch this. Because this is what happened in my life for about, let's see, 1984 to 1998, what is that, about 14 years? It, for 14 years, I wandered in the no King James Bible wilderness. Now look at what Lucifer says. Lucifer says this in Isaiah 14. I will exalt my throne above what? This Bible represents the stars of God 66 times. What does Satan say? I will be above the Bible. I do not, I do not sit under the authority of the Bible. I, my authority is over the Bible. That's what the Pope says. And every preacher who changes the words of this book. He puts himself as an authority over the Bible. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Mm. Christ is the head of the body. Who's the body? Church is. Who's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence? Colossians 2.19, and not holding the head. From, notice the word head is capitalized. All the, body, all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increases with the increase of God. So Christ is the head. We are the body. Now notice that picture up there. I have a picture of a skull and a spinal column. Do you know how many bones you have in your spinal column? 33. Now think about that for a minute. Let that sink in. Do you remember when Moses wanted to see God? And God wouldn't let him see him, but he said, I'll show you my back. Isn't that cool? 33. You know what? You know what? You know where that is in the Bible? It's in Exodus 33. This Bible's perfect. Now, out of each side of your spinal column, you have nerve bundles. This is how the brain speaks to the body, and the body speaks to the brain. So out, if you've got 33 bones in your spinal column, and you have a bundle of nerves coming out of the left, right side, and a bundle of nerves coming out of the left side, how many nerve bundles do you have coming down? Okay. However, I, and I have to correct this. This is a mistake I made. The bottom four, bottom four bones of your spine do not have nerve bundles. But the number is still correct because we have a set of nerves that come directly from the brain, not connected to the spinal column, that go directly down into the body. Enough to make it 66. Two of them are called the vagus nerve. One on the right, one on the left. And the vagus nerve coming directly from the head 
is where the head speaks to the body. It connects to the heart, the lungs, the stomach, and the bowels. And it's why when the head, when you get angry, that your heart starts pumping and you start breathing hard. Or when you get afraid, you start feeling it in your bowels. Or the first time you hold Sweetie Pie's hand. Remember that day? Remember that day? Remember the first time you touched her on the hand? And your heart was going... <laughs> that was the vagus nerve. That's God speaking directly to the body. See, this is the head. This is heaven. This is the body. By the way, where's the Holy Spirit at? Down in the body. Jesus left the Spirit down here with us. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Oh, I could do this all day. So you have 26 bones in your feet, but you have 33 joints. Now think about this. Think about it. 33 joints. How many feet do you have? How many is that? 66. So watch this. The scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his until Shiloh come. Shiloh's Jesus. 66. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman have conceived seed and born a child, then she shall be unclean seven days, according to the days of the separation for her infirmity shall she be unclean. And the eighth day of the flesh of, the, of his foreskin shall be circumcised, and she shall then continue in the blood of her purifying three and thirty days. She shall touch no hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying be fulfilled. But if she bear a maid child, then she shall be unclean two weeks, as in the pure her separation. She shall continue in the blood of her purifying three score and six days. That's 66 days. Now watch this. Mm, 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 mm. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ lo also loved the church and gave himself forth, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle nor any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Psalm 119.9 says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way. The word cleanse is 33 times in the Bible. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. So your feet, every place where on the soles of your feet shall tread shall be. And remember, you got 66 joints in your feet. Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand and they sat down at thy feet. Everyone shall receive of thy when the man of Gadarenes, who was delivered from the legion of devils, when he finally was delivered, where did he go and sit? At the feet of Jesus. Woo! I'm getting happy. Mm, mm, mm. Look at this. He put all things under his feet. Set my feet upon a rock. Suffereth not our feet to be moved. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder. The young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Both of them, 66. That means when the devil's giving you problems and aggravating you and tearing your family apart, get your Bible out. Read it. Read it. Read it out loud sometimes. Amen. Scare the devil to death. He turned my feet unto thy testimonies. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Let's see here. Let me get to, I got to, I'm still not, I haven't started preaching yet. Okay. Here's a picture of all of us preachers. But <laughs> about got it right, John. speak for myself I'm the union boss man I'm the shop steward Whew. speak for yourself you know how many teeth you have 32 plus a tongue what does that make Who hath made man's mouth? Jesus, the man who was 33 years old. And this is what he told Moses. I will be with thy mouth. Is that not what he said? What was Moses' problem? He stammered. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. 
And God said, I will be with thy mouth. 33. Now, when you have two mouths, what do you have? At the mouth of two witnesses. I wish I'd come up with all this stuff by myself. Actually, I did. Thank you. I know. All right. Now we're going to change tunes a little bit. Let's get the pulled pork out. This actually really is when, when Brother Wayne first called me, he asked me to speak on this subject. And it's, to be honest, it's the first time that, that I've been asked to speak on this. I've spoken about it at other churches. But this is the first time that a preacher has asked me to speak on this. I wouldn't do it if I didn't believe it was important. Now, let me kind of explain some things. Okay. I spent uh, this is not a boast. I'm just telling you that God gave me the time years ago to just eat this book. I read it and read it and read it and made notes on it and made notes on it and read it again. And every time I'd read it again, I'd find something else again, something brand new. And I just kept, God just kept pouring, pouring stuff in, pouring things in and just, just filling my mind with biblical knowledge. And then how, how I can see what's going on in the world and and, and find it here in the Bible. Brother Wayne handed me just before the service tonight. Where'd you get this? This says the Masonic Manual of Missouri. Now who remembers when the Da Vinci Code came out? You remember that? And that big, they made a big deal over it. Made a movie, everything about it. God told me to read that book, so I did. And that really led me into the study of symbolism. And I was already doing that, studying the symbolisms of the Bible, the typology of the Bible and so on. What I shared with you earlier about them going around Jericho 13 times, that means something. And then, then they shouted and they blew a trumpet on that day. That's showing you something that's going to happen in the future. There are other stories in the Bible that shows you what's going to happen in the future. Uh, who knows the story of David and Goliath? Okay, who's David? David is Christ. He's the shepherd. Okay, who is, who is Goliath? He's the beast of Revelation 13. In fact, David actually said... The, thy servant, he said to Saul, thy servant, me, killed both the bear and the lion, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. And if you look in Revelation 13, the beast is a bear and a lion. Okay? And he had sixes all over him. He was six cubits tall, and he had a, a shield that was 600 shekels of, of brass, I think it was. His brother had six fingers on each hand, six toes on each foot. He's got sixes all over him. So he's a picture of the Antichrist. Who wins, by the way? Jesus does. Amen? Amen. So I asked God to show me the secret of Freemasonry. And I read every book I could get my hands on. Morals and Dogma, written by Albert Pike in the late 1800s. Manley Hall wrote Secret Teachings of All Ages. Uh, Albert Mackey wrote a, a, an encyclopedia of Freemasonic terms and so on. And I've read scores of books on masonry. And you know what I found out? They never wrote down their secret in any book. There isn't a book in this world that contains the true secret of Freemasonry. Except this one. And I did. I asked God. I said, God, show me the secret. I want to know the secret. I looked everywhere I thought to look. And God said, do you want to, you want to know the secret of Freemasonry? And I said, yeah, I've been asking you for years. He said, it's in the Bible. Well, thanks a lot. It's only 1189 chapters. I'm sure I'll find it one of these decades. God even gave me the word to look for secret. 
And I found it in Daniel chapter 2. Now that I have the key to understanding what the secret of Freemasonry is, I can unlock every symbol that's in this book, that's in every Masonic lodge, every Masonic temple, every Masonic apron. I can unlock everything because the key to every secret is in this Bible. Jesus said, "There's." Uh, help me remember this verse. Um, he said something about every secret. There's nothing secret that shall not be made known. Nothing hid that shall not be opened or something like that. I'm losing my mind, I think. But that's what he said. Jesus will open every secret thing. If you ask him, he will show you. And I've been, I've had an interest in UFOs all my life as a kid. I came home with UFO books and books on Bigfoot, books on Loch Ness Monster, books on ghosts and haunted houses, books on this, books on that. I read everything I could get my hands on and was fascinated by that stuff. But I, and I, and I always had, had it in my mind that there had to be something, a connection with the devil if these things were real. Now, I'm going to ask you some questions and be honest tonight. Who believes in God? Raise your hand. That's an easy one. Who believes in Jesus Christ? Raise your hand. Who believes in angels? Raise your hand. Okay. Who believes in devils? Raise your hand. Who believes in aliens? I'll get the, re I'll get you there. I'll get you there because they're right in this book. They're right in this book. Now, the government has already said in June of this year, they exist. Our government said this UFO report government can't explain 143 of 144. What number? Mysterious flying objects blames limited data. I'm not going to read all of that, but take a look at this. This is the first known photograph of an unidentified flying object. This was in one of those 3D things that you put the cards in. I've got an antique one and I've got some of the cards. This photograph was taken uh, 1870. And there is a cigar shaped UFO there in the clouds. First photograph ever. This was taken in the early 1900s. It's not Photoshop. It's not camera tricks. Kenneth Arnold, June 24th, 1947. Kenneth Arnold reported seeing nine objects glowing bright, blue, white, flying in a V formation over Mount. Rainier in Washington State, he estimated the objects of uh, flight speed at over 1,700 miles an hour. Now, in 1947, we didn't have anything that flew at 1,700 miles per hour. We didn't have anything. And compared their motion to a saucer if you skip it across water. That's where the phrase, and if you look at what he drew, they... They're not saucer shaped. Okay. But the term flying saucer came from what he said. It looked like if you skipped a saucer across water and it skipped that he said, that's how they were moving. Not a normal flight pattern, but bouncing every now and then. Providing a, um, a prospector at Mount Adams saw the objects at around the same time as Arnold did providing a second witness to his story. This was, this photograph was taken in 1950. It has been proven. It's been examined. The original film has been examined. It's not a fake. It's not something hanging from a wire. Paul and Evelyn Trent were on their farm at Sheridan, Oregon. And they saw this object. They, it was flying around their house. They, they had time to go out and get their camera and take two pictures of this unidentified, unknown flying object around their house. The Lubbock Lights, 1951. This was in Life magazine. Texas Tech professors. You can tell they're professors because they have pipes. 
All professors smoke pipes. They saw the Lubbock lights. The Air Force now ready to concede that many saucer and fireball sightings still defy explanation. This was 1951. Salem, Massachusetts Coast Guard photographer took this picture July 16th, 1952. These are not saucers, are they? They're, li they're lighted or glowing objects and they're flying in a formation. Now, do we ever see things flying in formation? Yeah, geese, birds. That shows an intelligence. They do that for a reason. And let me explain something to you. Angels are just as real as you and I are. In fact, they're more real than you and I are. And we're, we're dealing with angelic sightings, but not good angels. Okay, I'm going to explain more. Sicily, Italy, December 10th, 1954. You can see this guy, he's running with his camera to try to get photograph of this in Italy. And I could go on and on and show you pictures that I've seen for years. And I'm going to show you some video here in a little bit. But I want you to take your Bible, turn to Ezekiel chapter 1. Everybody get your Bible out. What time is it? That's right. That's what I was going to say. It's only 6.30. Could I have a bottle of water? Thank you. And put some pulled pork in it. <laughs> Ezekiel chapter 1. Now, if you believe the Bible, if you believe the Bible, you'll see it. If you don't believe the Bible, you, you'll never get this. Ezekiel 1 verse 4. And I looked and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. Pay attention to that direction. It's very important. What came out of the north? A whirlwind. Remember, God speaks out of the whirlwind. The whirlwind is that Fibonacci spiral. Remember that? Uh, and a great cloud and a fire unfolding itself. Thank you, Brother Wayne. Appreciate that. And the brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof as the color of amber. What color is amber? Like an orange gold color, correct? Okay. I mean, if you were four or five miles away, could you see this thing? Definitely. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. We have a word for that called humanoid. So they had the likeness, they had the body shape of a man. But they had different faces. Face of an ox, an eagle, a lion, and a man. Now verse 12. And they went everyone straight forward whither the spirit was to go. They went. So the spirit is guiding these angels. Now, what are these angels, though? What are they doing? Their wings are joined together. They have, they have four wings. Well, Ezekiel says they have four wings. John said they had six wings. But they had four wings and the top wings were connected together. So that made a box. Basically, they made a box with their wings. Joined together at the corners. And above their head is a firmament. Like a sea of glass. Like a, like a glass crystal plate. Above their head, you get down to the bottom of Ezekiel chapter 1, you see that there's a throne on there. And God sitting on that throne. And it's the appearance of the glory of the Lord. So what is this thing that we're looking at in Ezekiel 1? It is the chariot of God. It is God's chariot. Now, does God need a chariot? 
No. I cannot tell you why God has chosen to ride in a chariot, but he has. And one of these days, I am too. You don't believe me, do you? How did Elijah... How did Elijah get to heaven? God's chariot. And God's chariots are angels. And did not Jesus say that, Christ, that God was going to send his angels to gather together his elect? We're going to ride, we're going to ride in style. <laughs> Woo! Whither, uh, verse 12 again, whither the spirit was to go, they went and they turned not when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. Again, if they were 10 miles away, would you be able to see them? And like the appearance of lamps. Lamps are lights. What, do, what did we just see here? And there. In fact, practically everybody that's seen a UFO at night, what did they see? Lights. Lights everywhere. Um, verse 13, as for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures and the fire was bright. And out of the fire went forth lightning. Now... Verse 14, and the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now, I want you to understand some, some basic physics that we cannot, it is impossible for man to get into any vehicle and immediately be doing 60 miles an hour and then immediately stop. Or be doing a hundred miles an hour and then make an immediate right turn. Physically, what happens to our bodies? Our body is traveling a hundred miles an hour with the vehicle we're in, in that direction. And when that vehicle decides to turn right instantly, what would happen to our body? It'd be crushed. And we would die. So this defies physics. This is called instantaneous acceleration. And everybody who has ever seen a UFO said, we saw it just went whoop and it was gone. Now, remember what I said earlier. I'm the kid that brings home all the UFO books, right? So I'm teaching this last year. And my mom comes up to me and says, you know, I saw a UFO. When? Well, when we lived down in Pine Bluff where you were born, Pine Bluff, Arkansas. You never told me? No, I didn't. Mom, didn't you see all those books I was reading? Yeah. Why didn't you tell me? I don't know. Her and her friend was coming home at night and there was a lake close to where we lived and they saw this bright amber colored disc glowing object hovering over the water. They slowed down to look at it and they, when they saw it, all of a sudden it went <laughs> straight up into the air and was gone. That's called instant acceleration. Now look at your Bible again. The living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. That's instant acceleration and instant deceleration. That's what they can do. It's because they're not from this world. The laws of our physics do not apply to them. Now, as I beheld the living creatures, behold one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. If it's a chariot, it's got to have wheels, right? And this one's four-wheel drive. Chariot. 
And the appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of beryl. And, the, and they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Now, you, I've got a picture of the planet Saturn up here. To me, that's what that is. A wheel in the middle of a wheel. And also, they just found out that Jupiter has rings. Saturn has rings. Neptune has rings. Oranos has rings. I'm not saying it the other way. It's stupid. <laughs> Oranos. It has rings. Okay? Atoms have rings of electrons. See, God does the same thing the same way every time, doesn't he? Okay? So that's kind of what I think it may have looked like. A wheel within a wheel. Verse 17, and when they went, they went upon their four sides and they turned not when they went. And as for the rings, notice he said rings now. They were so high that they were dreadful and their rings were full of eyes round about them four. So God's describing this chariot that he rides in and the wheels that go along with it. Now in verse 17, when they went, they went upon their four sides and they turned not when they went as for the rings. Well, we already read that. So verse 19, and when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Watch this. Whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their spirit to go. And the wheels were lifted up over against them for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Now, let me explain to you what that means. It means those wheels were alive. Is this book alive? No. This Masonic manual. No, I'll throw it at you later. <laughs> Yeah, this book is alive. Is this, is this book alive? No. No, it's dead. It, doesn't, it has no life, has no breath in it. It has no spirit in it. If something has a spirit in it, it's alive. Those wheels were living, were alive. Now, this chariot, this chariot is alive because this chariot is made of angels. And angels are alive. And all the angels had to do, the Bible's telling you that all the angels had to do was think what direction they wanted to go in, and they went in that direction. If they wanted to go up, they went up. If they wanted to go down, they went down. Wherever they wanted to go, it was just the Spirit moved it wherever the Spirit wanted it to go. It's the way God has taken this church. In the 30 years, Brother Wayne, wherever the Spirit wanted it to go, it went. And it did whatever the Spirit wanted it to do. Amen? That makes this church alive. Because it's got the Spirit in it. Amen? Jesus said, the words that I speak, they are Spirit and they are life. So, these chariots are living creatures. Now, if that blows your mind a little bit, let me tell you about a car I drove. A couple years ago, we had to drive from Minnesota to Fargo, North Dakota, because all the planes were shut down because they were going to have a blizzard. And they said... We can't fly our planes, but you can drive there if you want. Thank you. Appreciate that. So we rented this car out of Minnesota, and I'm driving to Fargo, and I notice the, car, the steering wheel is turning against me. And I, I'm going, there's something wrong with this thing. The, the steering wheel keeps moving, and I'm not moving it. What was going on was... There was something in that car that was reading the lines on the road and it, it was making the steering wheel keep the car between the lines. I don't like that. If I want to wreck, I want, I'm going to wreck. Leave me alone. Let me wreck. Don't save my life. 
we're 10 years away from having living automobiles. Are we not? My insurance agent told me five years ago, he attended a meeting of, of agents and they were discussing, they said, not if, but when the AI, artificial intelligent cars on, are on the road and there's an accident, who's liable? Who's gonna pay for the damages? Because if the, if the guy who owns the vehicle wasn't driving the car, he's not the driver. He can't be held accountable. The car will be held accountable. But the car cannot pay bills. We're fixing to run into problems that we have never faced before. So now, is it easier now for you to think that God wrote a living creature as a chariot? Thank you. Psalm 68, 17, turn there and underline this verse in your Bible. Now, while you're turning there, I'll tell you a story. A man by the name of Robert Lazar. Okay. Uh, Psalm 68, 17. Robert Lazar is the first guy ever to say in front of a camera, Area 51. He worked at a section of Area 51 called S4, Section 4. And he worked on one of nine captured flying saucers. And he said, they hired me, they sat me down for a few days, had me read a bunch of stuff on how they got some of these vehicles. One of them was part of an archeological dig. They've been underground for thousands of years. And he said, the one that I worked on, we were trying to understand how to get it to go. Because he said, I looked in it. It had three small chairs, but it didn't have anything like we would recognize. It didn't have play, it didn't have a, a bedroom, it didn't have a bathroom, it didn't have a kitchen, didn't have knobs and controls and wires and pipes and, uh, you know, it didn't have anything that we would recognize. And he said it looked like it was all molded just out of like a mold. And he said we figured out that the beings moved the vehicle with their mind. You just read that in your Bible. Wherever the angels wanted to go, the wheels and the chariot went and all they had to do is think it and they went. Does that make sense to you? So I can say as a Bible believer, I don't know if Robert Lazar actually did what he said he did, but I can tell you that what he said is possible from the Bible. Psalm 68, 17, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. Now you underline that in your Bible. God doesn't just have one chariot. He's got 20,000 of them. Way more than you do. The, so if you shorten this verse, the chariots of God are angels. That's literally what it says. God's chariots are living beings. Angels. Now, are there good angels? Are there bad angels? So if there are good chariots, there are... Now does it make sense? This Bible's never wrong, ever. Even when... See, Ezekiel was written after King Solomon. 
When King Solomon built his temple, when he built the most holy place for the Ark of the Covenant, look at how he built the most holy place. He put a, a big crystal glass plate in there and he put chariot wheels underneath it because he knew by the Holy Ghost that the Ark of the Covenant, the throne of God, sat on a chariot. And he put, verse 33, the work of the wheels was like the work of a chariot wheel. The axle trees and their naves and their fellows and their spokes were all, they had spokes on it. Like a bicycle tire, like a chariot wheel. When he made what held the Ark of the Covenant, he made a chariot. And he did it because the Holy Ghost put that in his mind to do it that way. He didn't read the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel wasn't even alive then. He did it by way of the Holy Ghost. So now, look at this, Zechariah 6. Turn there in your Bibles. Zechariah 6. And I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains. And the mountains were mountains of brass. In the first chariot were red horses. In the second chariot, black horses. In the third chariot, white horses. Does this sound familiar? Sounds like Revelation 6, doesn't it? In the fourth chariot, grizzled and bay horses. Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these, my Lord? And look at what he said. And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four what? I'll be... They're spirits. They're alive. The chariots were alive. They were spirits. Good ones. Because he said... These go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. These were the good chariots. And they were alive. They were spirits. But there's bad ones out there. And they keep diving down and disappearing and diving down. There are UFO sightings every single day around the world. Every day. You start following certain YouTube channels, they'll show you new UFO because everybody now has cameras. And everybody's taking videos of UFOs every single day. And 99% of them don't even look alike. There's multitudes of types and shapes and sizes of these things. They're everywhere. Now, again, I remind you, what is it? Second Kings chapter two, verse nine, it came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. That was an angel. That was a living chariot that came down for Elijah, wasn't it? It was an angel. It was alive. The chariot was alive. Um, oh, I like this story. Second Kings six, turn there, turn there, turn there. Second Kings six. Woo. Verse 13. This is Elisha. Elisha seen this. Elisha seen the chariot, didn't he? He saw the chariot that, that came and took Elijah away from him, didn't he? He knew what, he knew what they looked like. So when the evil armies compassed them about, he's, he's not shaking and scared and wanting a cigarette. And <laughs> it doesn't bother him because he's seen them before. Look at this. Verse 13. Go and spy where he is that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him saying, behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore send he thither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, and host. Now, remember, I want you to understand this. You are reading the future. 
You're reading a story that is going to happen. That's what you're reading. Because Ecclesiastes 1 says, the thing that hath been is that which shall be. This is typology here. And so look at what happened. And hosts compassed the city both with horses and what? Chariots. What did Pharaoh chase the Israelites with? What did Sisera use as his army against Israel in the book of uh, Judges? 900 chariots of iron. It's the Iron Kingdom, Brother Wayne. Are you starting to understand now? These chariots are important. I'm going to show you. So the whole city's compassed with chariots. Alas, my master, how shall we do? I need a cigarette. <laughs> then he answered, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Woo! Now, I, would, I want you to do some simple math for me. If I have one of those pies that y'all had out there, and I cut it in three slices and you stole one of them. Who's got more pie? Me or you? Because two thirds is more than one third. Am I right? How many angels is God going to kick out of heaven? One third. That means there's more angels on our side, two-thirds, than there is on the devil's side. One-third. Woo! Doesn't it make sense now? Aren't you glad you know me? They that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened his eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Woo! I imagine that young man went, <gasps> dropped a cigarette out of his mouth. Listen, God's got a whole army just for you. Now, how many angels are there? The Bible says we are in an innumerable company of angels, correct? Innumerable means that we, they cannot be counted. There are so many that they cannot be counted. And I'm going to ask you a question. Where is the last number? To us, it doesn't exist. And yet, God is so smart, he knows how to take an infinite amount and cut a third off of it. <laughs> would you trust God to sell you a gallon of gas? It would be a gallon, wouldn't it? Amen. Yeah. And there's so many of them. And yet God's the most high of all of them. The numbers keep going higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. And yet God is the most high. When you get to the last number, God's above that one. That's how high our God is. Somebody say amen. amen. And when they came down, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. You are reading prophecy here is what you're doing. You're reading a future story. Revelation 12. I've just mentioned this. His tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And in Revelation 12 again in verse 9. 
The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. First it said stars, then it said angels. So you know what the Bible's telling you? Stars are and angels are. And he's going to take a third of them. Now, get this in your mind. This story here back in 2 Kings is this prophecy here in Revelation 12. They're connected together. Because when those angels are thrust out of heaven, they're coming down with their chariots. Do you believe that? You should. Not because I said it. Don't take anything that a man says and believe it. Let God be true and every man a liar. Everything I'm saying to you, you go back to the word of God and say, God, I heard Mike Hoggard say this, but I want to know the truth. And I want you to show it to me in this book. I promise you, God will show it to you. Promise you, he will. So this event is going to happen. In Deuteronomy 32, 17, they sacrificed unto devils and not to gods, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. See, we're dealing with devils that no one really has ever, we haven't seen anything like this before. Throughout history, yes, there are events where people saw strange lights in the sky. Josephus wrote of an event in his lifetime that happened. Now, who's this man? Aleister Crowley. One of the most evil men uh, in, in latter times. He lived late 18, 1800s, early 1900s. His family was very wealthy, and he used, when they, his parents died, he used their wealth to get into every form of occult thing that he, could, that he could get into. And I mean every form of perversion as well. But Aleister Crowley spent six months trying to raise a particular spirit to come to him and speak to him. If that's for me, tell him I'll call him back. Don't, don't worry about it. I'll call him back later. Okay. But he spent six months training, fasting, learning rituals, doing rituals, performing rituals to get a particular spirit to show up, a God, to attain enlightenment from this God. And finally, one day, this God appeared, told him that his name was Lamb, L-A-M. Now, the word Lamb in Sanskrit, I believe, means the way. Now, see, that kind of tears me a little bit because I know who the way is. And he did not appear to Aleister Crowley. But he called himself Lamb, and he gave esoteric knowledge to Aleister Crowley. Aleister Crowley drew a picture of him. The one on the right is the being that Aleister Crowley saw. The one on the left is a recent drawing from people who have been abducted. If you don't believe in abductions, look up the story of Travis Walton. Back in the early 70s, Travis Walton was part of a group of men that was cutting up uh, branches and trees out of Snowflake, Arizona. I went past Snowflake as we were doing our road trip here a while back. And um, the, at the end of the day, they were riding in a king cab truck, five guys. And they saw light, 
up in the trees. They thought maybe lightning had struck one of the trees and they called it a, a fire in the sky. And they stopped to check it out and they saw that it was a ship. And Travis Walton jumped out of the truck and ran over toward where the ship was and was zapped by something held up in the air and it threw him down about 30 feet. Well, the guys took off in the truck. After about a mile or so, they said, we got to turn around and get Travis. They, when they turned around and went back, Travis is gone. The ship is gone. Now, they went and reported to the sheriff. The FBI came, Sheriff's Department came, they spent five days drilling these guys, giving them lie detector tests, everything in the world. These guys said, this is what happened. And they said, why don't you just, they had, they had uh, cadaver dogs out trying to, they searched the area looking for a dead body. They said, these guys got mad and killed Travis and they searched everywhere and could not find him. Five days later, Travis Walton wakes up and he finds himself laying on a table surrounded by about five or six of these guys. And to shorten the story, they dropped him off in the middle of a road about 30 miles from Snowflake, Arizona. He walked down to a gas station and made a phone call to his brother and said, it's me, Travis. To him, he thought he'd only been gone a couple hours. He had been gone five days. And when they, when they got to him, they put him in the hospital. He was de severely dehydrated, had not eaten in five days, had not drank anything in five days, had five days growth of beard on his face, everything. And to this day, the guys that, that were part of that, they've taken multiple lie detector tests and they've all said they were telling the truth every single time. I have a video. I don't have it on me right now. A lady was telling her husband, something's going on with me at night. I don't know what it is, but I keep seeing images of these things here. So the guy put a camera in his room, an infrared camera, and he captured his wife floating up under the covers, the covers going down and her body's gone. 10, 15 minutes later, covers rising up again, and all of a sudden her body appears back under the covers. That's on video. Okay, now I don't know what all that is going on. I'm searching in the scriptures now for it. Because I believe if it's true, it's going to be in this book. Okay. Um, June 25th, U.S. Department of Defense examined 144 unidentified aerospace phenomenon UAPs and determined that only one could be identified. The rest remain a mystery. In other words, the government is saying there are tr there are real. Our military is encountering real unidentified aerial objects that are making motions that we cannot duplicate. They are doing things that we cannot do. Uh. Here's a, a much anticipated government report on UFOs lists 144 known sightings of unidentified aerial phenomena. Now, the study released on Friday found only one of those can be explained, just one. The report is a rare example of the government acknowledging that it has investigated UFO cases. As David Martin reports, the lack of explanation is fueling even more questions about what else may be out there. Oh my gosh. There is no longer any doubt unidentified flying objects are real. This one was seen by now retired Navy pilot Alex Dietrich in her F-18 off the coast of California. There were two aircraft in our visual encounter. Each aircraft had two air crews. And then immediately following that, uh, a single aircraft with two air crew uh, who were able to lock onto this thing <laughs> and get the clear footage. It's been 17 years, and a new report by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence still can't explain that and more than 140 other sightings of so-called unidentified aerial phenomena, some of which appear to demonstrate advanced technology. The way that it was maneuvering, the way it was accelerating and also hovering, uh, it, it seemed to have capabilities that our systems would not have been able to 
display or, or keep up with. So certainly in that moment, uh, there was some shock and awe. The report says there is no evidence these objects came from outer space and no evidence they represent a technological breakthrough by a rival like China or Russia. Where they came from and where they go remain a mystery. But the director of national intelligence says they may pose a challenge to U.S. national security. Anything that is unknown that's as close to the coast as it was, I think that's a concern. This object went into the water, also off the coast of California, in 2019. The Navy could find no wreckage, leaving it next to impossible to determine who it belonged to. For CBS This Morning, David Martin, the Pentagon. So, no evidence that they're from outer space, uh -huh. no evidence they're a foreign rival, but it's a little concerning when you have a military aviator saying, we saw this thing, thing. we have no idea what yeah. it is. And, the, and that they, have, they appear to have advanced technology. I want to see nice. somebody waving. <laughs> yes. Zoom in there? Is there yeah. someone in the window? Yeah. No, Klaus on Steadicam said, I just, and I'm, I'm with him. I want to see somebody waving. Somebody waving from yes. the window in the cockpit? Yes. Uh, alien on board sign <laughs> taped at the window? Just something. Believe it or not, there's actually an, inc an incident where that happened. Um, let me show you. Well, I probably won't be able to get it pulled up here. Um, Lu Luis Elizondo, he used to be part of the Pentagon's group that was researching UFOs for the Pentagon. He was asked by one of the department chiefs in the Pentagon to stop investigating these UFOs and their encounters with military aircraft. He said, okay, I, I can do that. If you give me the order, I'll do it. But may I ask why? The Pentagon chief told him, well, we already know what they are. And when Elizondo said, oh, what, are, is it some sort of super secret special access program that we have? Is it one of ours? And he said, no. He said, have you read your Bible lately? And he said, well, I think I know what it says, but I don't know where you're going with this. And he said, these things are demons. We already know that. And you need to stop investigating them. That is what he said. Now, I, I can't get this video to play. When you mention something, you have... I hope I can get this one. This is Aguadilla Airport. It belongs to the Department of Homeland Security. It is in Puerto Rico. I have a, a friend who follows our ministry. He put me on to this video. A friend, he knows uh, a guy who knew somebody that gave him this video. This is an unidentified flying object flying over the Aguadilla Airport, Department of Homeland Security in Puerto Rico. You're going to see it. This is infrared video because it could not be seen with sight video. It could only be seen with infrared video. In a minute, you're going to see this thing go into the water without making a splash. And it will come back out of the water. It will split in two and go and disappear down into the water again without making a splash. They chased and followed this thing until it basically went into the water. To this day, they do not know this is, and this is a recent video. I'm gonna say 2017, possibly, something like that. But a, a, you're looking at something that defies the laws of the physics of this world. You're looking at what we've described tonight for you as one of the bad angels. Now, there it's just about over the water. And it's going to go down into the water. It's going to disappear. There it goes. 
and it's still moving as fast as it was in the air. The water did not slow it down. It popped back up. There it is. So when they catch it again, they're going to see it split in two. There it goes. Now, usually when something is flying through the air and it lands, hits in the water, what happens to it? You can fire a bullet into the water and it only has about two feet. That's as far as it goes. The water stops it. This was not stopped by the water at all. The water had no effect on it whatsoever. And they lost track of it. They lost track of both of them. And so they called it quits for the day. Now, let me introduce, I'm going to introduce you to another guy and I'm going to close it out here in a minute. I'm going to show you that these things are in fact devils. Let me read some scriptures for you. Leviticus 19.31 Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. God was saying this not just for the Israelites of that day. This Bible is eternal and it's for right now. Leviticus 20, and the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. God was serious about it. Leviticus 20, verse 27, a man also or a woman that hath a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Deuteronomy 18, 9, when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abomination of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or, watch this, a consulter with familiar spirits. Now, familiar spirits... They take on a lot of different characteristics, a lot of different things. I can prove to you without a doubt that what Saul saw, that's hard to say, what Saul saw at Endor was not Samuel. It was not Samuel. The witch said, I saw gods coming up out of the earth. And see, God had already said, Saul, I'm not talking to you anymore, either by prophet or by Urim and Thummim or by dream or vision. I'm not speaking to you by prophet anymore. So if God said that and he sees what he thinks is Samuel, it's not Samuel. It was a familiar spirit. Now watch this. We have the real Samuel and we have another Samuel. Did you catch that? We have the real Jesus. And we have another Jesus. A familiar spirit. Now, these are the... Think, think about this. Do you know how many gods they worship in India, in the Hindu religion? 330 million. Where did they get that number, 330 33. What is one third as a percentage? 33.333333. So the gods of the Hindu religion are basically the one third of the angels that God's going to kick out of heaven. And the, and the Vedic texts of India are full of the gods flying around in what they call vimanas. Flying machines up in the air, flying chariots, full of those stories. Now, these familiar spirits, God said, don't have, don't follow after anybody that has one, that speaks to one, that is in contact with one or nothing like that. Stay away from them. They're dangerous. God's warning us because they're dangerous. They're evil. Now, um, 
Here, let me show you who this guy. This is Dr. Stephen Gre- Stephen Greer, not Stephen Gree. It's not Dr. Stephen Gree Cicetti either. Dr. Stephen Greer was a ER doctor who left his practice to chase UFOs. He has spent most of his life trying to gather people from the military to come forward with their stories. In 2001, he gathered probably 12, 15 men um, at what he called the Disclosure Project. You can find this video on YouTube. It's called the Disclosure Project, 2001. Look this up. He got all of these men that were former military men to stand up in front of a microphone and tell their story of how they encountered a UFO while they were in the military. One guy worked at um, up in Montana at a nuclear missile base. We had 10 Minuteman missiles at that base. A UFO showed up and shut down all 10 missiles. Shut them down. And it took a week for them to get back up online. He was told not to ever tell this story to anybody, but he, Stephen Greer was able to bring these guys forward to tell the public what they saw. And they said, we're willing to testify before Congress that what we're saying is true. And Greer is still works. He's producing movies. He's producing documentaries. He is pushing to get people to um, welcome these UFOs and their occupants to be the saviors of this world. Now, Stephen Greer leads what he calls close encounters of the fifth kind, where he can gather people in a group. They all go into a yoga mantra position. They perform a mantra into your mind transcendental meditation ritual and call down UFOs usually almost 100% of the time UFOs show up every time he calls them down he has been in contact with these spirits since he was in college and he is leading what, he is one of the leading men in the UFO movement. He believes that these creatures, these aliens, have knowledge that we need to survive and that they are going to be our saviors of this planet. That's what he believes. So let me show you this. This is an actual video. Stephen Greer has got people at a beach. They've performed their yoga mantra and they've called down... The UFOs, and watch what happened. No, oh, it's not going to show it. Oh, oh my God. Oh, my God. Whoa, whoa, just don't, don't, don't talk too much. Up, please. Crouch down and look, because you'll block our cameras. Wow. Those behind me may move and stand up. Cause... Okay, that, you see that color? Yeah. That's not a plane. No, no. Oh, no. No, that's that's a so ship. So let's thank them for coming. Wow, and it's above the sea Please level. Please turn off your night scope, Charles. Off. Someone's infrared or whatever. Yeah, that's Charles. Oh. Oh, whoa. Oh, here they come. There are two. Whoever's right in the front, if you can kind of just stay low, because your low. head is right. You can get on your knees in front yeah. of you. Look at this, how gorgeous. Oh my goodness. Okay, so I'm looking with the night scopes. There's no smoke, there's no trails. These are not flares. And. Oh my okay, goodness. Okay, let's welcome them here. Oh, they're so they're, beautiful. They, they were waiting for us to arrive. Whoa. Shock, please photograph. Yeah, All yeah. cameras should be filming. So connect to them in your consciousness and invite them here. These are the golden ones I talked about. See how gold? Yeah. Because the horizon is only seven to ten miles, depending on the conditions. So it's probably a couple miles. Everybody wow. see them? Yeah. Yeah. They're so beautiful. 
let's welcome their uh, beings on board to join us in meditation. That is such a beautiful color. So you'll never forget that color. Yeah, this is a major event. So we are grateful. So open your heart chakra and send them the beauty of humanity. And if you uh, can see what I'm doing, you connect with your palms out like this and your third eye and your heart making like a tetrahedron radiating our pureness and love towards them. They emerge from the sky, but they're very, very close to the ocean. They're just hovering. They're not... Um, whoever's just right in front of the yellow kind of blue jacket, your head's... No, no, yeah, you just kind of went to go down. Okay, you know what, I'm, I'm going to move. We should be filming. I am filming, but just trying to avoid... Those in front, if you can get on your knees or sit on the ground and look in front of your chairs, but stay low. Thank you. I'm just going to reposition. You need a higher tripod. No, I, I can bring it high, I just don't want to... Well, don't wait, or you're going to lose it. Just yeah. Stay, yeah, just yeah, yeah, yeah. with it. There's not enough time for that. Okay, that's clear air. It just sort of vanished, the one on the right. They've stayed pretty much the same altitude, though. Wow. Let's invite them to come as close as they can. Safely. I need a time mark. Camp time? 9.15. 9.15. So the mark time. 9.15. 9.15. Oh, that's gone into the ocean. See what it did? Okay, there is still an object there. Very faint, I can see, with the night scope. Right here. Yeah, that's where uh, recording. Now, the way that you know that that's uh, not like something like a flare, first of all, there's no, it didn't shoot up and then come down and didn't drop. From the Two glowing orbs showed up one after another at that event. There was another event that Greer was part of where they called down UFO occupants. Do you, what do you see here? Let me give you a close up. That is a fiery flying serpent. Just like God sent to the Israelites when they complained about the manna that they were eating in the wilderness, God sent them fiery flying serpents. This is an actual picture of one that showed up at one of Greer's meetings. Now, to say the word alien is an exact phrase and it's a true phrase according to the Bible. Turn to Hebrews 12, uh, 11. Hebrews 11. Now, take a look at that picture. Remember that verse, Numbers 21 and 6. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. Remember, when you read those stories, you're reading... The future. You're reading what is going to happen. And what's going to happen is that because this world, every day that passes, the majority of this world turns more and more against God and His Word. And let me tell you something. God even magnifies his word even above his name. And every day this world is turning more and more and more against God's word. Complaining about the manna. And they don't want it anymore. And one day God is going to release these down to this earth. Do you believe that? 
Hebrews 11. Remember what Hebrews 11 is? What they call the Faith Hall of Fame? Oh, let's see here. Let's look at verse 32. But what shall I say more? Or what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the... And that word literally means they are not from here. Are they? They're not from here. They're not of this world. And by faith, God will allow us, I believe, to withstand the armies of the aliens, the gods, the fiery flying serpents. Did not Jesus say that he would give us power to tread on serpents and scorpions? If Jesus told us that, he told us that for a reason. My dad took me squirrel hunting one day and we were walking in the woods and I came across a black snake and I jumped 10 feet in the air, broke the world record. <laughs> and my dad said, oh, it's just a black snake. I don't care, dad. I don't like them. I don't go looking for snakes to step on. But in the day that God sends them down, He's going to give me power to tread on them. May the God of heaven bruise Satan under your feet. And how many joints do you have in your feet? 66. God will give you power. Trust me. No, trust him. Father, bless your word tonight. Bless this church. This is a, a supernatural world we live in. We are surrounded right now by angels, devils, good spirits, evil spirits, familiar spirits. We're surrounded daily and we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. Father, help us every day to put on the whole armor of God every day and take our swords and fight not just for ourselves, but fight for those who can't fight for themselves. Father, I know some people right now, people that are in my heart, in my mind right now, Father, that I'm fighting for. Help me to withstand. Help me to stand against them. Help me to be strong when I don't feel strong. Bless this pastor. Bless his family. He's a target. Every day, devils are going to work against him to try to destroy him, defame him, humiliate him, tear his life apart, tear his family apart so that wolves can come into this church and take the sheep. 
Father, I know all about that. I pray, dear God, that you would bless this church. They've been a blessing to me. And I love your people. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that every one of these people tonight, Lord, would take the things that they've heard, go back to the Word, and say, God, show it to me so I can believe it. Bless your Word and magnify it, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.